Welcome to Sunny School. We are on the second week of conflict resolution in marriage. This is topic number five in our Foundations for the Family series. Last week we went through just introductory ideas and one of the primary things in getting ready to solve conflict is the picture from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus tells us to get the log or the beam out of our eye before we go try to get the speck out of our brother's eye. And in our perspective, we must always think that the log is in my own eye and the speck is in my brother's eye. We talked about our goal in life. Our goal in life is to please God, to reflect his glory. If our goal is anything else in solving conflict, most likely things will not go well. Uh, one of the things we talked about is, is valuing the relationship enough to aim to restore it. Far too often we, we, we just try to get out of a relationship and we actually destroy the relationship in the process and we leave somebody behind rather than going through the work of restoring something. The picture in Galatians 6 about restoring each other is that of mending a broken bone. So when you break your arm and you go to the doctor, you don't want the doctor to just say, ah, it's pretty bad, let's just cut it off. You want the doctor to mend it in a way that will actually be profitable again. Um, one of the stories about that is a man named Ken Sandy, S-A-N-D-E, and he was a divorce lawyer. He was basically helping people to terminate marriages. But then as he'd go home and as he'd read his Bible and pray and as he'd go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, he started thinking, man, maybe I should actually be trying to help these couples to put their marriages back together. So that's when he started Peacemakers Ministries. Um, the whole ministry is designed to help people, churches, um, employers, um, others to, to sort through relationships and restore them to a profitable way of thinking and acting rather than to try to cut them off. We talked about wrong extremes when we're in conflict. One would be giving in, and we'll talk more about that um, this morning as we talk about when is it okay or when it is actually God's will for us to overlook something, uh, to, to kind of not gloss over something, but the, the word says love covers a multitude of sins. And what does that mean? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But often we are willing for the sake, because we want peace or because we don't want to put the work into it, we're willing to just say, eh, I'll just let that one go. And, and then we let it go and we let it go and we let it go until we have a monster on our hands. Uh, and this can be in our marriages, this can be in other relationships, this can be with our parenting, so many different relationships. So giving in would be one option that isn't good, it isn't right. We are to actively engage our relationships for God's glory, for the other person's good. But the other one would be to like ignore the problem. This is a little different than giving in to the problem. You just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, or, or maybe you respond in a way that doesn't address the problem directly. You do it by, think about Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned. What did they do? They went and hid from God. They, they tried to cover up everything with fig leaves. And they made excuses for their behavior. They blamed their spouse or they blamed Satan. They blamed somebody else. But none of those are good solutions in, in, in the long run in solving problems. And then a third wrong way to deal with a problem would be to try to win. I, I'm going to win at any cost. I will show them who's the boss here, or I'll show them who's right. And then we're willing to just fight until, until usually the relationship's destroyed and we never do win. There's no winners 
when we're committed to fighting. And so the person who just wants to win at any cost is usually not a good way to approach it. There's the chart in your notes about the person who has a high view of the relationship and, and is willing to take a high risk to actually engage and try to solve the problem with the other person. And we're going to try to work our way through some ways to do that here this morning. So here's where we're picking up Roman numeral number three, achieving the right balance. Achieving the right balance as we're trying to resolve a conflict, to sort through a situation and actually solve the problem. The first um, thing we should think about, letter A, is to ask the question, should I let love cover this? Should I let love cover this? A couple of verses to think about. One is in Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all transgressions. So hatred, I'm, I just want to get into this and I want to pick a fight and I want to just stir things up where love might, love might cover it over somehow, and we'll talk about what that means. The New Testament version of that is in 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Again, what does this mean to have love cover something? Covering a problem with love is not the same as ignoring it. Uh, and here's four times when love cannot just ignore a problem. So you ask a question, is this offense, is this particular problem or event or circumstance or character trait or action, is this a sinful habit that is regularly hindering his or her growth. Notice regularly hindering, sinful. There's key words there. So for instance, if, if I come in the house with my dirty boots and I walk across the kitchen floor to get a, a, a drink from the kitchen sink or if I go to wash my hands at the sink or something, and I do that once, every six months or something, that may be something that Betsy would say, I understand, he was just really in a rush, he wasn't thinking, it wasn't a sinful, ongoing habit that was hindering his growth, and she mops it up and, and goes on about life. Uh, so there, there's things that, that our children do, there's things that our spouses do that are a one-time event that, that you say, ah, I'm not going to make a deal out of that. That doesn't seem to be something that is a regular problem. So that is a question. But if it is something sinful that they're doing over and over and over again that is actually keeping them from growing spiritually, I probably should, should care enough, love them enough to not cover it over, but to dive in and try to help them with it. Second question, is this offense public knowledge that would harm the person's testimony for Christ. And, and you can see something like this. I saw your name in the paper, and you were arrested for. Um, how can I help you with this? Um, or, or, or it could be any number of other things that are not quite as public, but, but people know about this. Third question, is this offense a violation of the law? Uh, is this something that the government is saying, no, you can't do that. And, and now I have to decide what am I going to do in, in response. And then number four, is this offense a clear violation of a biblical principle? Does the Bible teach, do this, and this person is doing the opposite? So those are four questions. Any observations about that or even illustrations? So, so you're asking these questions, and that will help you think through. Should I just, just not ignore, but overlook this for now? Or should I just let love say, you know what, that was a one-time deal. It, it seems to be okay. 
Uh, letter B, listen carefully and quietly to the other person's position. Have you ever picked a fight and then come to find out a day later, a week later, you didn't understand the facts at all? So ask questions and listen carefully. Um, the importance of listening, Proverbs 18, 13, he who gives an answer before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. So don't go diving into a problem that you're trying to solve if you don't even know what the problem is, if you don't know what the circumstances are. So question, how does listening put us in a better position to solve problems? Any input about that? How does listening put us in a better position to solve problems? More information. Okay, we, we have more information to, to work with. If you have very little information to work with, you, you don't have much to work with. Good. Yes? Yeah, sometimes the problem we observed was not the real problem. Um, sometimes the problem we observed was, was just the cough was not a symptom of COVID, it was a symptom of lung cancer or something. So, so as you start listening, you start saying, ah, there's, there's more going on here than I understood. Um, often our, our teachers in school that are working with the special needs kids, they're dealing, they're putting band-aids on problems but sometimes they know that this poor kid is in a home that is there's drugs involved or alcohol involved or whatever involved, and, and the poor kid is, is, is showing the symptoms of something far different. So good. Anything else you, you can think of? Teamwork shows teamwork, give and take. Oh, oh yeah, Let, let's work on this together. Teamwork. It's not, I'm, I'm the expert and I'm going to solve the problem. It's, let's, let's work on this. Let, let's work together on this. Shows care. Yeah, I care for you enough to, to listen to what you are thinking and feeling. Good. Uh, well, it gets our brains thinking about finding a solution rather than either just hiding yeah. it or arguing about it. Or good, good. We'll, we'll get to this picture here in a couple pages of are we aiming the problem at the person, uh, aiming our, our anger at the person, or are we actually aiming to try to solve something? So as we're listening, we're actually getting our mind thinking about, okay, what is the solution to this, rather than I'm mad at you? Good. Um, so we, we get the, uh, to understand the other person's thought process. We get to understand the other person's motives, why they did what they did. Often their motives were clear as could be. Why were you driving 80 miles an hour? Well, the cows were out down on, uh, on the main road down there and, and I didn't want there to be an accident. So I was in a rush to get down there to, to get the cows out of the road. You, you know, so you're starting to understand somebody else's motives. Um, you, you're not running in blindly. Um, again, Tony's thing about you're getting more information, you're, you're, you're understanding better what's going on. And, and then the involvement with the other person, the teamwork that Deb mentioned, that, that we're working together. Okay, letter B, what is a, small b, what is God's view of a person who's not willing to listen first and be a learner? Well, Proverbs 18, 2, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. Do you know somebody who just wants to put in their two cents? Uh, a fool doesn't delight in understanding what's going on, what the other person is thinking. Proverbs 18, 17, the first to plead his case seems just until another comes and examines him. Uh, that's why, as children, you wanted to be the first one to get to mom and dad. Uh, because you wanted mom and dad to take your side, not the other person's side. Proverbs 17, 10, of reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. God sees us as foolish or even the proverbial fool if we're not willing to listen and learn. So number two, this is under listening carefully and quietly. 
it's important to listen. But then the number two is to develop and use diffusing statements. And I'm going to warn right up front not to manipulate. I know people that have used this type of statement to, to manipulate somebody rather than to humbly learn. Um, I really appreciate your concern about this. Do you? <laughs> or, or are you just trying to get the person off your back? But, but let, let them know. We're on the same team. We're going to work through this together. We're going to solve this. Thank you for being concerned. Um, thank you for being interested in this problem. I'm glad you're concerned about this. Um, am I hearing you correctly? You said this. Did you mean this or this? You know, asking clarifying questions. Am I hearing you right? Is this what you're saying? What, could you say that again, please? Again, don't, don't do this to manipulate. That's not our point. Remember, our, our goal is to restore to productivity this relationship, not to get our own way. Um, as I'm getting older, I find myself, say that again, <laughs> you know, and you lean over, <laughs> say that again. And I don't know if you are like this in your relationships, but I will, will have missed just the last little phrase that Betsy said. I said, say that again. So she'll start way at the beginning and say it a different, no, 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 no. What did you just say? I don't remember. <laughs> you know, so, so our old age and hearing and memory <laughs> is kicking in. But, but, you know, it isn't necessarily bad to start at the beginning and hear this again. So could you say that again, please? Could you say that a different way? What do we usually say? Could you say that again, please? We just say it louder. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, no, say it a different way. Um, I see this as important to you, therefore it's important to me. And make sure you're doing that in a way that your attitudes and your nonverbal communication shows that it's important to you. Let me think about that a minute. <clears throat> Uh, I've, I've described to you my dad. Um, you, you would ask him a question, and it'd be silence, dead silence. Or, or you'd say something, dead silence. It, it, it took a minute to, to kick in. You, you know, it, 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 the, the gears were, were, were getting up to speed here. So, so give me a minute. Um, that, that's a good thing to use when you are thinking about something. And, and I tend to be that way too. Betsy will ask a question and I'll be thinking and she'll go on to the next topic and I won't have gotten to really answer her yet. Uh, still thinking about it. Uh, I think she asked me a question last night that I'm still thinking about. So, Who are we having over for Easter? You, you know, I, I haven't forgotten the question. I just haven't gotten to it yet, you know. Um, Show genuine concern about your, your, your mate's feelings. If they're fearful, if they're angry, um, understand that and, and show that you are concerned about that. Um, thank you for taking time to share that with me. Do you have any suggestions as to what I could do to improve in this area? Oh boy, don't ask that unless you mean it. But you know, they often have an idea what you could do. Uh, so, so that's not a bad question to ask. Um, did I hear that it, you said it upsets you when I do? Well, thank you for, for letting me know that. Because I didn't know why you were so upset. Sometimes we guys especially are just plain numb when it comes to our, our understanding of what other people are going through. And so when somebody says it upsets, it, it upsets me when you do, we ought to listen. Uh, are you saying you want me to discuss issues of this kind with you before I make a decision? Um, what's for supper? What's, uh, if, if I buy $5 worth of stuff, if I buy a new car without discussing it. You know, there's, there's different levels that, that different couples and relationships are comfortable with. 
Um, and I, I would just say, be, be attentive to each other and learn from me. Learn how the other responds in different ways. Um, I'm not clear what you meant by that. Could you, I, I want to understand. Talk, talk to me some more. Um, say that a different way. I, I really want to want to hear what you're saying. Um, am I hearing you correctly? Could I do do that differently? Tell me how I could have done that differently. Uh, what are you seeing me doing wrong? Uh, I'll, I'll go a totally different situation. In Bible school, we had what we called preaching lab. We also had speech class where you'd get up and give speeches, and then everybody would tear you to shreds. And, and that was intimidating because they were pointing out what they saw you could do differently. And, and usually, if you would listen, when they were responding to your speech or your sermon, you, you could actually learn an awful lot. Um, so, so, you know, what am I, what did I do wrong? How could I do that differently? I, I certainly didn't see that clearly. You know, that, that would be something you could say. Um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'm glad you pointed that out. When did that happen? I wasn't alert to that. Um, I see that's important to you. I'll make a point to be more alert. Anything else you can add to that? I, I know there's overkill here, but probably there are directions that we could go that we haven't gone. These seem, yeah, the diffusing statements. Yeah. It'd be nice to have those to approach statements. You know, like, how do you approach someone when you want to, yeah. How do we open a conversation? Yeah. This is how to diffuse conflict, but how do I even start a conversation in ways that aren't causing problems, that, that, that actually solve problems? Because often, often in a conflict, the first words are, are not pretty, <laughs> often. And how do we even open a conversation? And I, I, I think you could take these uh, and, and put some twists on them. Going, go back to your, your rules of communication and in the topic number four, think through that I actually care for the person. I want what's best for them. I want to keep things open and honest. I, I want to be clear about what I'm saying. I want to communicate clearly and, and learn how to, how to approach a conflict in that way. Good, good point. Let's move on. We're still under letter B about listening carefully and quietly to the other person's problem. And number three under that is learn to ask clarifying questions and that we've, we've already suggested some of those. Um, ask a question that would better help you to understand the situation. I'll, I'll just throw one out. Um, long distance. Rachel texts me. The van's making noise. That's helpful. Okay. I'm, I'm glad this is a concern to you. Could you talk more to me about that? You know? So, um, I said, okay. When? Moving, not moving. Just setting with the engine running, um, when, you're, when you're accelerating, when you're slowing down, um, when the air conditioning's on, when the air conditioning's off. And I, so then she actually sends a video of noise. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, I think I can picture that noise, but here, here are some more questions for you. And it's not in asking questions that we're trying to cause more problems. We're trying to get to the bottom of the issue. And we're willing to take the time to go back and forth on the questions to clarify what's going on. And, and those are very helpful for you to, to, to learn how to ask questions that would clarify what the other person is saying. Okay, letter C, state in clear and concise terms what the actual problem is. This probably gets to what Betsy is, is saying. How do I even approach a conflict? And how do I open this, this conflict? Often when we're 
upset, often when we're having a conflict, we don't take a minute or two to actually think through and to state clearly what we see the problem to be. Uh, Proverbs 10, 19, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. He who restrains his lips is wise. Often there's a lot of words that go into a conflict, but very little clarity in those words. So think clearly, think concisely, make it short. How would you say in a sentence what this problem is that you're trying to solve? Uh, so be clear about that. It helps us, um, it, it helps the other person. You, you're loving the other person enough to, to clearly state what you want changed. Right? You ever been in a conflict where somebody was pointing out the problem but not pointing out the solution? So you, you finally say, well, what do you want me to do? Oh, I don't know. Well, what are we fighting about if you don't even know what you want me to do? Uh, if, if you don't even know what the solution is. So think about it clearly um, when you come into finishing. Any comments about that? Um, maybe you're going to get ahead. One thing that I didn't really think about when the kids are little, but if kids are agitated and angry, they aren't going to listen to you anyway because right. they can't hear. Think about when you're angry and upset. You need to take a step back and and cool down before you can think logically about that. Mm -hmm. So in our situation, the higher a child's escalated, the less you say. Mm -hmm. And you want to wait until they calm down. And I think that that's with all of us. We don't hear well mm -hmm. when we're angry or upset. We, we can't mm -hmm. process even though it's logical from someone else. Okay, good. So the illustration was, was school situations with behavioral children that are escalated. They're not going to listen to you right now. So in thinking through again and, and what is the problem right now, most like going to, back to what Joe had said, that this could be a symptom of, of, a, of a different or a bigger problem. Um, th this this explosion right now is probably going to make it so we can't even have a conversation. So there have been times when when a, a tool that was handed to Betsy and I, to me especially, is Betsy, I really am committed to solving this. Um, let's plan to meet in an hour and talk about this, or let's plan to meet tomorrow when you get home from school because we're so busy here. And, and with, you think about it, I'll think about it, pray. and pray about it. Let's pray together right now. We will sort this through together. So, so you're communicating that you want to solve it, but yet in, in the middle of an escalation is often not a good time to think clearly, communicate clearly. Um, Depending on where you are in your relationship, often a hug at that point is a good thing, or, or a good solid handshake. You, you know, we're both upset right now. Let me shake your hand and say, I'm committed to dealing with it. You agree with me? Let's, let's solve this. And, and let's do it. Let's meet whenever. So, so those are some ways that we can do it. Good. Um, letter D, rejoice you don't have to solve this problem alone. And, you know, Deb already brought that up about teamwork. Ecclesiastes 4 talks about two are better than one and how, how we're coming together to solve this problem together rather than just one of us having to sort through this. One of the application questions under this, not solving this problem alone, has to do with how can God use another person to help you be more like Jesus Christ. Remember our goal in life is to be like Jesus, to reflect him, to please God by reflecting his glory, etc. So how can God use this other person to help you in doing that? And, and some of the ways would be they show me where I need to change, they show me what I'm doing wrong, um, they're pointing out um, things that need to change about my life, 
They're giving a direction for me to change. They're correcting me. They're saying, maybe you should try this instead. Uh, they're encouraging me. They're rubbing off on me. Yeah. Well, um, Tony set me straight last week. You know, like, I was upset about something, or I don't even remember, Tony, what we were talking about. And she just gave me another perspective. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I need to think about this biblically. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So, so often they, they can turn, I like using the globe. You know, and when you look at one side of the globe, we, we see America. And the whole world should be like America. And then we spin it around. Oh, my, there's Ukraine. Well, Ukraine should be like America. You know, and we, we, turn, we don't try to understand what's going on from the other side. And, and, yeah, the other person can help us see life more clearly by seeing things from the other side. Okay, moving on, letter E. And this is still under the Roman numeral of achieving the right balance as we're coming into a conflict. Brainstorm truths from the scripture that will help you to solve the problem. So you've defined the problem, and, and look, in today's world, defining the problem accurately and biblically is, is absolutely essential to actually finding the biblical solution to the problem. Uh, Kristen and I are going through a book right now. Chapter 7, Kristen? <laughs> I, I almost chapter 9. She's nine. in chapter 6, I'm in chapter 9 maybe. But it, it's a worldview type of a book where we're trying to see how different worldviews would answer questions like, am I loved? Um, what is my purpose in life? Um, is, is there any hope for peace? Uh, questions like that. And then it, it, it approaches it from the secularist or materialist. The, this would be the, the hundred year old um, evolutionist, the Darwinist, who just says we're, we're just a blob of cells. If we're just a blob of cells that evolved, what, how would they solve those problems? Um, in today's world, 2022, there's probably far more Marxism than we realize. Oppressor, oppressed, where you see it the most is in critical race theory. Um, the white are obviously the oppressors. The blacks are obviously the oppressed. And what we need to do is we need to just turn that over. Yeah, that'll solve it, won't it? We just need to create more conflict in order to solve things. And then there's what we would call maybe new spirituality, where these would be all the Eastern religions, these would be, a, these would be the Oprahs, these would be the Joel Osteens, these would be um, Eastern religions, um, Buddhism, those types of things, where you just have to be one with nature. And, and and, and we humans just have to blend into nature, and that'll solve everything. But then we also live in a world that's postmodern. Truth is not truth. Truth doesn't matter. And, and you put all those together, and when you're trying to solve a problem, you, you gotta try to understand, am I really seeing this from a biblical perspective? Or, or am I actually pulling in the world's views in seeing myself as oppressed by Betsy today. And, and, and the, the solution to that in the Marxist viewpoint is just to flip the, turn the tables. Well, that isn't a biblical solution, um, but often say on medical diagnoses that often come into behavioral types of things where we blame our actions on everybody around us that sounds an awful lot like Genesis 3, doesn't it? With Adam and Eve. Where if we were to diagnose correctly, I was wrong when I yelled at you in that way, in that unkind way. That was not edifying communication. That was unkind. 
I was bringing some bitterness in there. It showed that I had not forgiven you for this thing over here. And would you forgive me? So, so we've, we've listed the Bible diagnoses and we've gone to the biblical solution. Would you forgive me? And it's very crucial as we're thinking through to brainstorm scripture in, in, in trying to understand what's going to help. Several suggestions there in your notes about how God's word helps us. Question, what is the relationship between regularly attending Sunday school and church along with personal Bible study and a person's ability to brainstorm truths about solving problems? So, so we're involved studying the word of God on our own. We're going to Sunday school. We're going to church. We're, we're trying to learn how to apply scripture. What's the connection between that and this ability to brainstorm truths about solving problems? Maybe I jumped the gun on my application a few minutes ago. We know more. Right, we, we know more truth. We have more truth to hang on. Any, any other additions to that? Yeah. Going back to like the book we're reading, mm-hmm. the more that I'm under, like my brain can get so twisted into thinking false truths, the bad ideas, you know, and think I might convince myself that I have the truth and how I should solve this problem. Good. The more exposure we have to the Word of God, the more stable our thought processes are, and the more likely it will be that I see things correctly in this situation. And, yes, there's maturity that comes as a Christian as we spend time in God's Word. That's how we grow in maturity. That's next Sunday morning sermon, by the way, out of 2 Timothy 3, you know, that the man of God may be mature, you know, fully complete um, as, as a believer. Good. Um, that's why we're spending four weeks, four Sundays in Sunday morning sermons talking about the Bible as the foundation for a church's ministry. Is we're, if we're not building on the Bible, we will be very unstable as a church. According to the following verses, what does God promise to do that will help us resolve conflicts? So James 1.5, uh, after it's talked about these many diverse trials that we're going through, it says, James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, generously, without reproach, it will be given to him. So what does God give us? Wisdom. Wisdom which is not just knowledge, but the ability to put that knowledge into practice to solve problems. Think Solomon with the two moms and the one baby. You, you know, that Solomon had limited knowledge about what the truth was, but it took wisdom to get to the bottom of that. Okay. Second verse, James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So God can answer our prayers, use our prayers to actually help us to grow in these areas. Uh, I, this session isn't about prayer. But one of the things about prayer that we need to remember is often we we say something like prayer changes things. But maybe a better way to see that is prayer changes us. As, As I humbly, based on what I'm learning from Scripture, go to God and and talk to him about the problem I'm up against. Prayer actually changes me in the process. And God helps me through my prayer time. Okay, next, top of the next page, letter F, is brainstorm as many acceptable solutions to the problem as possible. But then there's this chart. And let me just do this for the camera, see if, see if the camera can see it. 
But talk to me about the chart. How does that help us understand our, our viewpoint of a conflict? What are we often pointing at in a conflict? The other person, right? So, so we're, we're pointing our finger and we're hurling our insults. We're, we're attacking the other person. And, and we never do get to the problem. Where if we were to be aiming our attention, our efforts at, at a solution, and both parties are aiming at a solution, that then goes to solving the problem. So you brainstorm this. So what are the differences there? Just talk to me a little bit more as you observe that. Any illustrations of this, if you dare? A statement that I learned probably in grade school. What does that have to do with the price of eggs in China? Yeah. That was a long time ago. We, we don't hear that a lot anymore. But often in a, in a conflict, things are brought up that, that don't have anything to do with what we're trying to solve. Um, another way I'll, I'll give that illustration is we have the feedback, the gunny sack hung over our shoulder. In every little thing the other person has done, we throw in there. We, we throw that in there to save because we might need that someday. And now a problem comes up over here that has nothing to do with anything we have in this feedback. But yet we pull the feedback out, we throw it out there, and, and we overload the person with stuff that has nothing to do with what the current problem is. And that really isn't a good way to solve problems in relationships. Um, th this goes back to our communication skills in, in topic number four about keeping current relating to our communication, not letting things build up. Um, sometimes this is difficult when, when you're off at work all day or you're away for a week or something like that. But understand that you're not just saving up unrelated things to throw at the person. Anything else you're thinking of? Let me just say this as well. Sometimes focusing on the problem alone does not lead you to a solution. Uh, this goes back to what I had mentioned about somebody attacking me or, 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 or bringing up a problem and going really upset and going on and on about you did this and you did that and you did the other. Okay, so what are you proposing? Uh, what, would, what would be the solution? I don't know. Um, and sometimes attacking the problem doesn't ever really come to a solution to the problem. So aim your, aim your thoughts and your direction and your energy. E even your, your anger, your, your, your upset, aim that energy at finding a solution to the problem. Anything to add to that? Sure, there's more you can think of as we go on. Letter G, choose an acceptable solution while giving deference to the other person. Choose an acceptable solution while giving deference to the other person. Philippians 2, it's leading into this statement about Jesus, but it says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Um, even unbelievers understand this. I'm, there's, there's a lot of books about business dealings. And if you making a business deal with somebody are actually helping the other person accomplish their purposes while at the same time negotiating towards your own purposes, everybody comes out better. Um, so one of the things that you, you talk about when you're buying a car is, especially from a dealer, but even from an individual, I, I don't, look, I'm not asking you to lose money on this. 
I'm not asking you to go in the hole over, or over me buying this car. Um, but but the price that is on the windshield right now is way too much. And, and, and that does not fit my situation. So I'm thinking them too. I don't want them to lose money, but I, we're negotiating. Now, when we come to a Christ-like response in Philippians 2, I'm not thinking about my own first. I'm thinking about them first of all. That's unselfishness. I'm trying to come to a solution that will benefit them the most rather than benefit me the most. So this is different than just a business deal where we all come out ahead. This is, I'm actually deferring. I'm actually saying, how, how will that be best for you? How do you see this solution being, being worked out in a way that would benefit you? So we're thinking in that direction. And then last, letter H, if you still cannot get the problem solved, seek counsel from others. Proverbs 11.4, where there's no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Uh, so sometimes we, we're talking to each other and we just aren't getting anywhere and we say, could, could you come in and help us see clearly? It, by the way, don't call somebody in if you're not willing to be proven wrong, because often you will be proven wrong. So allow somebody to come in and say, ask for help. It, it takes humility to do that. Um, it takes graciousness. It takes, it takes love for the other person that you're in conflict with to be able to, to humbly say, we need some help here. What's interesting about this is, is sometimes, usually, one, one of the parties is asking for help, asking, would you be willing to get somebody else to help us think through this? And then the other party saying, no, 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 we got this. <laughs> we, we can handle this. Don't ask in our marriage how that works. Right? <clears throat> yeah, usually it's, usually it's, you usually it's <laughs> you, I, I think you can guess. Yeah. Um, often there's pride involved there. And when there's pride involved, we're usually not thinking about the other person's benefit. And, and that's difficult when it comes to a conflict. So if, if there's anything you, I want you to remember when it comes to conflict, humble yourself. Be willing to let the other person benefit in the solution. Now occasionally, going back to the should love cover this or should love dive in and try to solve this, often we can tell that, that by is this hurting the other person? Is there active sin involved that is habitual, as in day after day after day, and it's hurting them and their spiritual growth? It's hurting the people around them. Um, I don't think we had put that. Let me look. Um, yeah, I didn't even put this in there. But under question number one on Roman number Roman numeral number three, letter A, question one, is this offense a sinful habit that's regularly hindering his or her growth? Um, we could add a question in there. Is this hurting other people? Are there people around them that are being hindered in their spiritual walk or being hurt physically by this action of the other person? So that would be a question you could add there that, that is helpful. But, but then love the person enough to, to try to carefully dive in and help them to restore them to productivity. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we need your help in these things. We're proud people. We're sinful people. We don't see clearly many times. And I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves before you, learn from you, spend time in your word, to care about other people enough to try to solve problems with them. And we ask for your strength and your help and your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.